OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to Intro to R, Primer to Learning R uh, with Victor Fagans, me. Um, so I'm the president of the Stats Club. Uh, and I'm just going to be talking about R and how it's used. So a little bit about me. I'm a statistics major here at UTSA. I'm a junior, plan to graduate next spring. And I consider myself to be quite the R, uh, I guess I wouldn't say R, I'm still learning R, but uh, coding in general, I do a lot of it. I have done a lot of summer projects, summer internships, where I get to kind of just do coding all day. And uh, I just actually did a data fest this past weekend with Alex, who's here today. So, you we we get I get to use R a lot on a on a weekly basis. I would say not daily basis. I'm just, I'm not that crazy with data, but uh, definitely weekly basis. Um, so yeah, I'll be using presenting with an R presentation, which is some a presentation I made with R R Markdown. So we'll see how it goes. So what is this presentation? It's uh, going to be talking about what R is, how to use R, some important vocabulary that you need to know, and you know, just kind of help you get more comfortable with R if you're not really feeling that comfortable already. So we're going to be talking about it. So what is R? R, I like to say, is an open source statistical coding language, right? So statistical coding language, because the main audience, the people who use R, are data scientists, statisticians, people who work and use data for research or business purposes. And so R is a statistical coding language, right? It's often to compared with Python. I'm sure Python is very popular. I use a Python a lot, it, but Python is a general programming language. So you can make like a video game with Python. Uh, it would be really hard to make a video game with R. Right, because Python's like a general programming language, or R is a statistical coding language. You can do a lot of cool things with R, but it's natural habitat. And what it works best with is with tabular data. And what tabular data is, is like an Excel sheet. So here I have an Excel sheet open. Um, you can see here it has variable names up top and then rows of information. Right. So that's what data is, tabular data in this case. Uh, data takes a lot of different forms, but this is kind of our ideal world uh, to work with. Okay, so let's keep going. So get, like, getting access to R, so R is open source, which that just means like it's free and people are adding to R as we speak on, on the way to go. People are developing R, continuing to develop it as they go. And so there's websites that you can go to to access R and install R. And so you can install the R language, and then you can install R Studio, which is the preferred kind of integrated development environment. So that's like a vocab word for you. It's simply just the tools you use to work with R. And you don't need R Studio. R Studio is what currently I'm using to, to make this presentation, but you can use Base R. I mean, it does the same thing. Here, I'll open it up for you. It looks a lot less pretty. Um, but you know, some people don't care. I mean, it works. Look, one plus one, two. It works. It works. Um, you know, I can run analysis. I can look at data. All the same functionality. It's the same programming language. It's just kind of like the bells and whistles, so to speak. Uh, nope. Like for example, this presentation is with R Studio. I wouldn't be able to make this in regular R. Let's go talk about the basics of R. So R is an object-oriented language. So let's go over what some objects are. So here, how R works is you can assign kind of words, numbers, files, anything you can think of. You assign it, this arrow, to a variable, right, an object. So here I'm going to say 50 is going to go into number. Hello is going to go to word. True is going to go into logic. And so these are simply the objects that go into it and they're saved in here. So it's like algebra. So like number letters are now numbers. It's kind of like that. Whenever I refer to a letter, it has like some kind of meaning uh, underneath which I'm assigning here, right? And so we can use str function. And what a function is, it simply takes in an object and outputs something that the function does, right? It takes an input, gives you an output. That's what functions do. 
And so here we can see the structure, that's what STR stands for, of number is that it's a num object. It's num, right? it's a number. Let's see a word, the structure of word is a character and we can see that it's hello, right? So character in some other languages, this might be string, but uh, here it's character. And then the string of logic, right? Which is true, all caps true, is all logic. So true, false, those are logic, they're special. They're really important for programming. We won't go into too much conditional programming here. That's kind of a, it's advanced, it's like an intro to R. So objects have rules. Okay, guys, I'm gonna, I want some interaction here. What do you think is gonna happen when I do five plus hello? What do you guys think is gonna happen? I want interaction, give me. Do it guys, do it, we're not gonna move on. Error, Austin saying error. You are correct, Austin. Error, five plus hello, non-numeric object binary operator. So yes, you cannot add hello and five. I wish you could, but you can't. So let's try the objects, word and numbers. If you remember word is hello, number is 50, still the same. Like I said, like it's not gonna work because underneath the hood, that's 50 and that's hello. So now how about this? Logic plus number. What do you guys think is going to happen? I'm going to drink some water while you answer. Go on, guys. Logic plus number. Remember, logic is true. Number is 50. What do you think is going to happen? Interaction. Come on, guys. Error. Alex saying error. Well, Alex, it actually is 51. Oh, that's kind of weird. That doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. But because underneath the hood, true is considered one and false is considered zero. So that sometimes gets you in trouble, but actually it's something you can utilize when writing certain functions in code. You can be like, oh, I want to see how many trues there are. I can just add them up and adds all the ones. So, but you might also get yourself into trouble when you maybe accidentally add it to something. So let's talk about combining objects. So before we were just talking about single objects. So now this is like a series of objects. So here I use the concatenate function, which is C and concatenate just means smush it all together. So here I do five, three, two, one, alt and commas, num vector and did. Um, STR num vector is a uh, structure. So you'll see the structure of that. You can see num one through five, five, three, two, one, zero. Okay, words, you can kind of make cat, dog, turtle, the essential pets, right? I think we all can agree, dog, cat, turtle. Uh, to see the structure of that, we get character, one, three, cat, dog, turtle. So see, it's a character, still a num, and then these are what they call indices, which tell you kind of like how long the object is. Um, so we can see logics, Combine true, false, true, false, string of logics. We get true, false, true, false, and it's a logic object. What do you guys think is going to happen if I do this? If I mix it. C1 cat true. What do you guys think is going to happen? We're not going to move on until I get an answer. Let's go, guys. What do you guys think? Error. Mirror is saying error. Well, mirror, you're close. It does create it, but it forces everything to be a character because character of course is the less is the most kind of less restrictive object right anything can be a character right so it for cuz it only what this is is a vector and so it ha everything's forced into one type of object right so i mix it i get a bunch of characters so let's talk about subsetting so trust me guys things will get exciting soon i'm just getting the basics I'm just getting the basic so we got that num vector, right? You guys remember five, three, two, one, zero, right? So if I in index it, so if you guys are familiar with Python, it's pretty similar. Uh, you get a brackets and you do one and that's gonna grab the first object, five. So that means it has a one starting index. Some other languages might have a zero starting index or five zero, but R it's one. So we can grab a series of things. We can grab like a section of it, right? So this is going to grab the third to fifth 
uh, item. So see, the third to fifth, th 210. And then the words, you can do the same thing. Cat, dog, turtle. Let's grab the third one. It's going to be turtle. What do you guys think that's going to do? Word minus one. And what do you guys think? What are you guys going to think? Not a rhetorical question. We're not moving on. Come on, guys. You can do it. Turtle. Turtle? OK. Tiffany's saying turtle. Maybe Tiffany's familiar with Python, because that's how it works in Python, but not in R. Minus signs in subsetting just means without. So it's actually going to remove cat. So Tiffany, if, you were, if we were in Python, you would be correct. But unfortunately, or fortunately, or uh, we'll, be, we'll talk about Python versus R later, maybe after, after the presentation. But we are working in R, and minus signs means without. Let's talk about lists now, lists. So you guys remember before when we did mixed and it forced everything to be a character? Well, lists is the solution to that problem. So here, what do you guys think is gonna happen? Well, first, let me show something really cool. Here, I'm doing some fancy R tricks. I have a semicolon, but just basically makes me save space on my presentation. I get to put two lines of code on one line and break it apart by a semicolon. Fancy R trick, not that important. Very, very few people use it, but I can do a list of one cat true, and I'm going to look at the structure of that list afterwards, right? So this is the same thing as it being like on a new line structure, but I'm just kind of putting it on one line with a semicolon. So I get the structure of that list, and I can see here num character logic. It kept its attributes, which is important. That's cool. It's very flexible lists, very flexible. So now we can combine our, remember our words, the essential pets, our num vector, our logics, and do strings lists, uh, not string, sorry, structure. Other, I think other languages use string for str, um, but r is structure. Here we can see that it, it mixed them all together. See the essential pets, our 5, 3, 2, 1, our true, false, true, false, and it kept them all the same. Character, num, logic, no changes. So that's really cool. That's really cool. If I want it to all be in condensed in one object, a list is where to go. Um, subsetting with lists, right? So subsetting can be really complex, but just the basics, right? So you can get the lists with one bracket, lists with two brackets around the one, and lists with two brackets around the one and one. So the, what this gives you is just the first list, right? One means first, so it's going to give you this list here. And then if you want the actual vector, you need double brackets. And then you get the actual vector. And then if you want something out of that, you use another bracket. So cats. So subsetting can be very complex. We're not be going into super advanced subsetting, but just kind of the basics. You need brackets and you need a number. So later on, we'll be going into the names, but this is kind of the basics. So data. Let's talk about data now, right? Why do we even look at R? It's data, that's why. That's why we look at R. Uh, getting data into R. So one of the very first challenges people have when their teacher tells them use R uh, is getting data into R, right? So how it works is we use absolute path or regular path. We'll, I won't be going too much details into paths, but we can use an absolute path. Uh, and a path is basically a location of the file on your computer. So here I'm trying to get to iris.csv and I can do properties of that file and it has a location, see? So it's basically the address. So if you're not familiar with file paths, you can watch some, some videos on it, but this is basically the, the, the basics. It's the address where the file is located. One of the biggest problems people have when they first run R, at least on Windows, is this error. You know, I don't even know what that means. Well, I know what it means because I'm giving a presentation. That's a real, that's the only rhetorical question you guys will get. But it's like slash you use without hex digits, what the heck? It's because R doesn't like these backslashes because backslashes mean something special in R. So what you need to do is you can either use two backslashes and then it'll work or change them all to forward slashes. So Windows by default gives you this, these one backslash. R does not like that. 
Um, if you're on Python, if you're on Macintosh and Linux, I don't believe that there's a problem. I think both those OSs use forward slashes on default. Uh, I don't use either of those systems, so I'm not sure. But I'm, for Windows, this is what you need to do or make it into forward slash. And so then it worked, no error, awesome. So now we can do head. So head is a function that lets you see the first six observations of a data set. So see, I got the read.csv. It's the function that reads in the CSV and saves it into this object. And then I'm reading it in. And I can see here that the variables and the species. And then here I can look at Excel and it's the same thing, right? So yeah, it worked. Okay. So now let's talk about the working directory. So I won't, like I said, I'm not going super in depth on kind of how you should set up your file system, but the working directory is basically the hub for your work. So if you want to avoid giving read.csv your super long path, you can just set your home, your working directory, and then now you can just give it, you know, where the file is. And so it doesn't, it's basically setting a start point for to where to start looking for that file. And if you have multiple of these read.csvs and you're working with multiple files, yeah, you don't want to have a bunch of these guys throughout your code. Because if it ever changes, it's going to talk, take a lot of rewriting to fix your entire code. So set a working directory to your, your workplace. There's more advanced things you can do. We won't be going into that. Um, that's just kind of how things will go. So you can see we did head on the data frame gives us the first six observations, right? Same as Excel. It's like, I'm just looking at this op six. I'm just doing it in code form. All right, so let's talk about extracting info about the data, right? So the data's in R now. Okay, we saw a little bit of it. We used the head function to see the first six observations. What else can we do? We can run the structure function, right, str. And we see that it's a data.frame object. That's the type of object it is has 150 observations, it's got five variables, and then here are the variables names and what kind of object those variables are, right? Num, 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 character. Sometimes you get data sets and they're all characters because like I said, that's the safest format to save data in. Um, but so you, these are good things to check to know of that each variable column can be its own type of object. So you can see here species, they're the names. So it makes sense that's a character. Um, so we can run summary, right? So summary is really nice. You can get the min, the median, the mean, the max, get some quick descriptive statistics, right? You can see species doesn't have that because it's a character. And well, here's where I like to do a kind of change to Excel is like, if I were to calculate the min, first quartile, median, mean, third, max in Excel, it might take a while. I mean, if I do min here, oops, shoot, I accidentally press enter. And then I were to highlight all this and then enter and then go across. That took like, I don't know, like maybe a second, two seconds, because I knew how to do it. Um, if I were to do that for every single one of those uh, statistics, it'd probably take like around, I don't know, five, 10 seconds. And that's because we're working with a small data set. So, or I can just do summary, take like half a second, right? Summary, data frame, get it all at once. So I, I like to think if you know what you do in R can be really fast. Learning it can be slow, but once you learn it, you can work with data really fast uh, when compared to Excel. So let's talk about subsetting data frames. So we're talking about regular subsetting of objects, right? So it's interesting because data frames have rows and columns. So here I'm gonna take the first 10 observations and I'm gonna look at the first column. And here I get the numbers. There we go, we can subset data frames. Same thing like with brackets. One really, this is normally how it's done um, is with the name. So you can use this dollar sign notation and do the name of the variable and then do the brackets. And that'll give you the first 10 specifically. This is preferred because it's more readable. Right. If someone were to look at your code, they'd be like, okay, that's CPU length. So when else would to look at this, they'll be like, what's variable one? I don't know what variable one is. So this is often the preferred way of doing it. How about creating plots? So when it comes to plots, I like to showcase them not in presentation mode. So I'm going to rerun the code here. Let's see here. Uh, run it. 
and then I'm going to make this big. Work, do it. Plus, what happened? What's wrong? Data frame, not subsetable. What the heck? What's going on here? This is why you don't think do things live. Plus, plus. All right. Give me, give me, give me, give me a plot. There you go. See, it's an XY plot. I did just plot and then I did a data frame length, pedal length. This is what I get. Cool. XY plot, scatter plot. If I were to do that in Excel, let's see here. I want to do this. And then I can I type and then I type in kind of hold control. And then I do data. And I do no insert scatter plot. Right here it is. Doesn't look exactly the same. X axis kind of off. Let's see if we can fix that. Uh, more options. Let's make it four. There you go. So that looks pretty similar to what we had before, right? In R. Very, very similar. So there you go. And like Excel didn't take too long, right? Um, one of the fun things though about R is that I can quickly just try out different variables. We'll, we'll see about that. So let's go back to the presentation here. So you can look at correlation. I don't know, have you guys familiar about statistics, but a correlation is simply like a measure of direction. So you can see here that it's positive direction, right? As sepial length goes up, pedal length also goes up. So we get a positive correlation. This is in a statistics class, this is in R class, so why is it relevant? If I wanted to calculate correlation in R, I would first need to use the data analysis tools and then use the correlation, click OK. And then I can't, so the input range, I can't do two columns, the two columns need to be touching. And so I just need to select these three variables. Oh, went too far. Labels. Okay, so here I get the same value I got before in R, 0 0.87, 0 0.87. But I think it's a lot faster just to type in core variables of interest than Excel having to kind of, you're limited by that you have to use the touching columns. And if I had a lot larger data set, like I'm talking like maybe 20 variables, uh, that's gonna be a lot harder to finagle with to get that correlation going. Or you tell it what it wants and it gives it to you. Let's talk about pairs plots. Like I said, I'm gonna use over here. Here is a pairs plot. And so what this is, I just use the pairs function and then I use just some subsetting to grab the first four variables. And so here, what this is is sepia width, sepia length, like the box determines the X and Y axis. So this graph, right, that's X axis, it's bottom is sepia width. Sepia length is the y-axis. You can see I made a bunch of graphs just with this little bit of code, pairs, and then it, and it made a pairwise plot so now I can compare. And oftentimes in statistics, these plots are important because you want to quickly assess if there's a linearity, right, kind of these straight lines or any other kind of weird pattern. And so this was really quick to do. If I were to do this in Excel, like one, two, three, four, five, six plots, all the combinations, it might take a while. It might take a while. So here you can see like boom with R like that. If you know what you're doing, you know, if you knew about the command. So now let's talk about packages, packages. So I'm going to drink some water. Any questions so far? All right. No questions. I'm guessing that means I'm under, you guys are completely understanding what I'm talking about. So let's go, packages, let's talk about packages. So packages are like a simply their collection of functions and tools that someone else has developed. Think of it like going to Lowe's and buying like a toolkit. It's like, I have my tools at home, like that came with whatever, but I wanna buy a specialty toolkit because I wanna get into ice sculptures, you know? Like that kind of stuff. That's what packages are. It's like you're you're just getting just getting more tools. So some popular packages. 
or like ggplot, mass, deplier, caret. There's a bunch of packages. Oh, well, that's what makes R open source is that people create a package and then they make it available to the community. And then the community is like, wow, I like this package. I'm going to include it in my work. I'm going to use it for my work. And so we'll be, we'll, be, we'll be showcasing some packages here in a little bit. So using packages, you have to install the packages in R. So you do install dot packages, quotations, the name of the package, it installs, and there you go. Now you have it. So let's try using it. So for those of you who know, those of you who don't know, filter is a function that's included in the deplier package, and it lets you kind of filter data sets. So you give it a data set, and then you give it a condition, and it's going to filter it. So basically what this one is, like if species is equal to Satosa, so if I go back into Excel, here's Satosa, right? So it's only going to grab those observations, and it's not going to grab all the other ones because Satosa, we're only interested in Satosa. So let's see if it works. Oh, it didn't work. Oh, error and filter, object species not found. Oh, that's weird. Well, actually, you need to call the package with a library function, a library function. So you say library deplier, and that pulls it in. It's, it's all right, like, hey, I'm going to use these extra tools. I'm going to use these. I know it's not normally built in, but I'm going to use them. I have them installed. And R is like, OK, ready to go. And so now when I do the filter, I get unique. And unique's a function that just tells me how many unique instances of a data is, how many observations, unique ones. So I'm going to give it, I, I do the filter, I set it to set for Satosa, and set, uh, name the species, right? That's the name of the variable that Satosa's in. And I get Satosa. Awesome. It worked. Normally there would be three there, but because I did the filter, there's only one. So now let's compare packages. Like, why do we have packages? Why do we need packages? So here is with base R. And base R is basically R without any packages. We just, we just came in, you know, you bought the new R and then you took it out of the box. That's all you had was base R. So if I wanted to do the same thing, but with Versicolor, you know, data, I do the data frame and I do the brackets, right, for the indexing, because it's a special type of index. And I say, Give me all the rows, because the index is on the left here with the comma, that have this condition, and they give me all the columns, because it's blank after the comma. And then after unique, I get versus color. And then here I'm using filter to do the same exact thing, and it gets the same result. So what you know, what what you may prefer, maybe in this instance, maybe someone would prefer this, someone would prefer this. I think this might be a little bit more legible, right, at a glance which is important about code. That's like a new new, you know, trend in coding is it to be legible, right? So after the fact, you can read what this is and know what it does. This, you may not like remember like, oh, there's a lot of brackets there. Uh, I don't know what's going on. What, why is the count comma? But this, oh, I'm doing a filter. Okay, cool. It's human words, human words. So let's look at another package. So here we're comparing ggplot2. So I'm calling the library ggplot2 with base R plotting. So let's look at these plots, huh? Let's see here. Base R. Uh, nope, that's a player. Here it is. Here is the plot with ggplot2, right? Here's the code for it. ggplot, you give it your data, you give it its x and y axis, and then you tell it what kind of plot you want. In this case, scatter plot or point plot, you get this. We can do the same exact thing in R using this plot gives you x-axis, gives you y-axis. Let's see what that looks like. Now, what do you guys think is better here? This one or this one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? Uh, the, the capture depends on what you're using the plot for, right? So like this one, you know, has black dots and it's great background. This one's, you know, just white dots. And, you know, in terms of code, this one's a lot simpler. Right, that was like really quick. This one, I like had the data frame, I needed the comma, these aesthetics, geom plot, I had the plus sign, seems more complicated. And it is right now. But trust me, this is going to be like simpler than this eventually. GG plot rules indeed, Alex. Uh, so here we are, next slide. So here we're going to do comparing with a little bit more complex of a graph. So here, let's run it. 
here is ggplot, but now it's coloring by the species. So you can see here, there's red here, green here, blue here, and here's the key, right? So this is a lot more informative of a plot. Now to do the same thing, or very similar thing in base R, this is the code you need. Just same thing, you know, black, red, green, you can see the difference. Though in terms of the code I added, the only thing I only change I made in the ggplot was I added this color argument, right? Equal to species. And here I added this legend statement and added a color as factor because like I said before, D DF species was a character before when I was showing the structure and factors are like categorical. So I needed to use this as factor thing to turn the character into a categorical. That's a new object that I haven't talked about. So there's a lot of different types of objects, but you can see, you know, what do you guys prefer now? This graph or this graph? And then which code do you prefer? This code or this code? You know, so I prefer this code. All I had to do was add this column. I didn't have to transform any of the variables. I didn't have to like decide on where to put the legend 7.43. That's where the legend goes. And like do this unique and color one through length and PCH one. It's pretty simple. So maybe before when we were doing the simple plots, regular plot was better. But when you get to the more complex plots, ggplot2 is going to be the tool that's really useful. All right. And now we're getting to the end here. Conclusions. So R is hard. Okay, R is confusing. It's uh, They call it a, a language for a reason, is it takes practice to do and it takes time, right? When you work, but when working with large data, like Excel won't cut it. Excel is going to take a very long time to do anything and there's limits, a size limit to Excel. And R, when you're working with data that's large, R can handle it. The limit is really like how much RAM you have on your computer, right? And today we just kind of did the tip of the iceberg. We just kind of wet the tongue of kind of what R, what R does, how does R work, right? If you're, once you understand like the base R objects, like what a list is, how to subset, um, like, you use this documentation to, to kind of pull up the help, right? As you do question sign, and then you're like, what's the, what does GG, what does filter do? Tell me what filter does. And then it like, I want the deplier filter. And it tells you what it does, it tells you its arguments. I need data and I got options. So, you know, that's, that's once you kind of understand the basics, it's really easy to kind of snowball and learn more and learn more and learn more. It's just really slow at the beginning because it's like just a different way of thinking. If you're coming from another programming language, it's a lot faster. So in, if you're trying to decide a language to learn, it really depends on what you're trying to do, right? If you're interested in doing, making a website, you know, like JavaScript, HTML, interested in doing some statistics, R is a good contender. Python is also good, but I think R has a lot of built-in statistics uh, packages and functions that Python doesn't, that you need to use a little bit more extra packages to do. So uh, yeah, those are the conclusions. So further learning. For those of you who like saw this presentation and you're like, hey, I wanna learn more R. I think R, I need it for my class. I need it for my work. I need it for my job. Here are some really wonderful resources for you to use. R for data science book. It's free. It's an HTML file. It's just a website. You can read through it. UTSA gives us access to LinkedIn Learning. You can watch a bunch of videos on a bunch of different topics. Data Camp, you have to pay for it. I think it's a, like, a, like 200 bucks for the year. It's kind of pricey, but if you if you already kind of know, like you, you want to know more about particular types of coding, I've used Data Camp before and it's, it's pretty good. You know, and start your own project. Like I said, this is like a language. It takes time, it takes work. And you really got to put in the hours if you really want to become really good at it. And so recommend starting your own, your own project. Learning statistics is, are, like I said, statistical coding language. Not everyone knows statistics. Not everyone likes statistics. But if you'll be working with data, statistics is important. 
So, you know, those online courses, edX, Coursera, right? UTSA courses, you can minor in statistics or just take audit some statistical classes. You know, you can audit edX classes for free. You know, you can just tune into a class, watch their lectures, learn some new things, really nice. But um, that's kind of the end of my presentation. And to kind of showcase something cool you can do in R, so today we just did some basic stuff, but like I wrote like this R code, it looks really complicated because it is, but I, I know how to do it. Um, I wrote this R code to track our attendance for the stats club, right? So I wrote this R code that uses the Google Drive package to get all our attendance sheets and here are all our attendance sheets for all the events. Eventually you guys will be on here too and kind of combine them all into a super attendance sheet and we can see who attends our events or not, right? And so that's not, that's not something that has to do with statistics. That's not something that has to do with like data. That's like administrative, but because I knew coding, I could do it. And, you know, it didn't take me long to write the code, maybe a couple hours. And, but now every, for whenever we need to see the total of attendance, we can just rerun that code and, and get the, get the totals. But uh, that is all I have. Are there any questions? I'll put the attendance link in the chat. All right. Any questions? 10 seconds. Five, four, three. No, that's five seconds. What am I doing? 10 seconds. Uh, do that twice. Um, all right. Well, then, there are no questions. There we go. Have a, have a good day.